Tonight's talk is about the geographical and social, political, religious background to Lord Buddha's teaching. As you know, the uh, teaching took place basically in this area. It's a kind of small area in a way, in northeast India. This is where the Lord Buddha was teaching. Sometimes we hear about him being over here, and sometimes we hear about him being up here near Delhi, over here near Mumbai. But myself, having studied the scriptures, I think myself, he probably never got out of this area. So the first um, thing I want to discuss is how did the Aryans, the Lord Buddha was a part of the Aryan uh, peoples, how did the Aryans get there? Because the Aryan homelands were originally around this area above the in the Caucasus, in this sort of area. This is now, I suppose, lower. Uh, it's like the, the Ukraine and that sort of area and uh, southern Russia. Uh, but the Aryans started in this area and uh, spread out with the migrations. The migrations took place over quite a long time, like thousands of years, uh, before they came down all the way into India. And even in Lord Buddha's time, they hadn't uh, progressed all the way into India. It was basically only to this, this part here. But it had taken thousands of years for them to progress over into Europe. This is Greece over here, and they went up, this is kind of Bulgaria. Uh, this is down into Iran. Iran is a cognate word for Aryan. And then down here, and down in through Pakistan, and into India. But this was all taken quite a long time, you know. It didn't happen overnight. Whilst these um, migrations were going on, there were three uh, great ancient civilizations in the ancient world. There's the Egyptian civilizations, which was along the Nile. All of the ancient civilizations, of course, were along big riverways, along uh, great riverways, because that's where the uh, water was and also where you could trade from because you could send out uh, merchant ships to other areas and so on. So it gave rise also to a lot of trade and so on. So one, one of the ancient civilizations was in Egypt, which everybody knows because of the pyramids and the sphinxes and uh, the remains that are there. The second great civilization was the Mesopotamian civilization that was between, Mesopotamia means between the rivers, uh, between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, it's basically where Iraq is now. Uh, that was also a really great civilization in the ancient world. And the third one was the Indus Valley civilization. It doesn't look so clear on this map the way I've drawn it. But in fact, the Indus Valley Civilization was uh, the biggest of the civilizations. And uh, it's very important for us because uh, a lot of the Samana culture, of which Buddhism is a part, has probably come down from the Indus Valley Civilization. Uh, it's really a wonderful civilization, quite unlike the Egyptian and the Mesopotamian. It has very distinct characteristics to it. For one thing, they had extremely well-developed uh, city planning. All their cities are laid out on uh, grids and very well-developed drainage systems, well-developed irrigation systems and so on and so forth. If, if, if you know something about the, this civilization, it was really a wonderful uh, achievement in those days city planning on a huge scale, like really these were big uh, cities, not small things, 
and they'd obviously been planned and laid out on grid fashions like this, with big city walls around and so on, with uh, able to capture the water coming down in the Indus and the other rivers, the Indus River Valley, the Indus Valley has five rivers down there, able to capture the water and keep the uh, city you know, in water throughout the year and so on, so there's no real dry season or whatever. Uh, another very interesting characteristic of the Indus Valley civilization is, you know, if, if you look at any of these ancient civilizations, when you uh, dig up the remains, you find many weapons, you yeah. Obviously, you find many weapons, but in the Indus Valley, there are no weapons. It's, it's as though they had, a, you know, a totally peaceful civilization that they developed. Uh, so it's also another interesting characteristic about the Indus Valley. And the other thing about it is that you get this not uh, an awful lot of information from the time itself, but we have like terracotta plaques and things like this, which have some, some information on it. The script that they were using in the Indus Valley, nobody has been able to this day to be able to decipher, so we can't read what they wrote. They're writing in some sort of um, hieroglyphs or pictographs, and nobody has been able to decipher it up to now. But the pictographs themselves tell us some things. So we do get uh, pictures of people appearing, anyway, to be sitting in meditation in in these uh, pictographs on these ancient terracotta plaques. It's quite significant, you see, when we come down. So the Aryans moved down, and this is where the Indus Valley was. The Aryans were uh, a, really a warrior type people, a warrior race, and they basically, as far as we can tell anyway, if we look in the Rig Veda and the old Vedas, they talk, Indra is called, one of his names, Indra is the great god in the ancient Vedic religion, one of his names is Smasher of Cities. This is one of the things that he's called, is the Smasher of Cities. And it appears that the Aryans, who were a nomadic people, didn't like city life, and as they progressed across the plains into India, they smashed the uh, Indus Valley civilization. And it took about a thousand years before it recovered to a state where you started getting the building of cities again. Yeah. The Aryans did quite a lot of destruction as they came into India and uh, destroyed that civilization and basically it appears that part of its culture has come down probably through the Samana sects as I'll explain later but the civilization itself was wiped out. It was almost certainly uh, in contact with Mesopotamia through these sea routes possibly also with Egypt through these sea routes and it was a very highly developed civilization that was completely lost and it's writing materials and everything like that we can't decipher because of the destruction that took place. So the Aryans were still progressing into India at the time of Lord Buddha, you see. That's uh, around 500 B BCE. We don't exactly know the dates of the Buddha. Uh, the traditional dates place, place it earlier as the people, you know, uh, West, Western scholars, for instance, will place it later, and it probably is later. If you look at the archaeological evidence and everything like this, for the cities that existed at the time of Lord Buddha, they only started about 100 years, in certain cases like Benares a little earlier, but places like uh, Sarvati, which is one of the main places that the Buddha was teaching, Rajagaha, one of the main places the Lord Buddha was teaching. In those cities, the archaeological record only goes back to about the 6th century. So they were quite recently built up. 
a, a reason for this, why this was uh, taking so long to come into India, is because the whole place, the whole of this area was densely for forested. And being able to make progress in those sort of areas was very uh, difficult. They didn't have, the Iron Age actually starts about uh, 1500 BCE, okay, in India. That means there was some iron implements at that time. But it wasn't until they progressed into Magadha that they really come across iron deposits in great quantity, right? Iron makes a really big difference in civilization. So you could say that uh, realistically the Iron Age started just before Lord Buddha and it's at that point that they were able to start clearing the forest, right? starting to plough the lands because you need iron for ploughing, yeah? plough the lands and they also had weapons of course. This is also very influential on the political scene as I'll explain later. And the centre of the Aryan world, which had been up here around the Afghanistan-Pakistan area in Taxila. Taxila still exists. It's difficult to go to because it's in the middle of the war zones in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So, you know, nobody likes to go there anymore. But Taxila was a major centre. It's mentioned many times in the Buddhist scriptures, especially in the Jatakas, it was famed as a center for learning for the Brahmins and so on. So the center of the Aryan civilization had been up here until they made progress into India and came to, over to northeast India. They made these iron mines. It's actually quite near the surface, very easy to dig out and everything and then they were able to make all these implements and once you've got that situation the social situation changes uh, quite considerably because you're able to grow a surplus amount of crops yeah, that you can uh, use with that surplus you can bring people in from the countryside into cities so city life makes a very big difference in even now you see everybody is still now to this day they're exiting from the from the countryside and they're going into the cities yeah it's happening now as well but it's been happening from that time too okay so certain things happen at, the, at this point this is maybe say a hundred or 150 200 years before the lord buddha's time one of the things that was happening is the Aryans were a pastoral people. That means they were nomadic. They were with their herds. Their herds of cattle and they were basically living on their cattle. And at this time, because of their discovery of iron and being able to engage in agriculture, they were going over from being a pastoral people into being an agricultural people. So this made a big difference in their lifestyle. These are early coins from about the 6th or 7th century uh, BC and some of the earliest coins that were minted. Before then they would have been trading actually in kind because they, you know, because when, when you're a nomadic people it's basically not a monetary culture. It's a, a, a trading culture in kind. Whatever you've got, you would trade for whatever somebody else has that you want, and it would uh, go like this. But once you get the rise of agriculture, you get the rise of the surplus, you get the concentration of people into cities, then you start getting the rise of the merchant class. Very, very important for Buddhism, because as uh, you probably know, the two main uh, groups of people who were supporting the Shramana cultures were the merchant class and the noble class, that means the kings. 
If you read the Tree Pitaka, you'll find all the supporters for Lord Buddha, basically anyway, come from these classes, right? But if you go back even a hundred years, two hundred years before that time, you don't have a merchant class. You don't have a kingly class at that time. Uh, they were basically small uh, republics at that time. And at Lord Buddha's time, they still had memories of these 16 great states that were found throughout India. The actual nations or the states are the ones in green. The other ones are important for other reasons to us. In uh, thing, and these ones in grey, these are actually modern uh, cities, so that you get some indication of where things are. It's Calcutta and Agra and Kathmandu and so on and so forth, like this. This was the Sakya, Sakya people. Okay, one of the main things that was happening at Lord Buddha's time, it was a very dynamic period probably one of the most dynamic periods in history at, at that time. And these kind of small kingdoms that existed and that we know about, these are names that come from the Tree Pitaka. It, they, they talk about the um, uh, Mahajanapada, the great states. These are mentioned a number of times anyway in the Tree Pitaka. And one of the things that was happening was that these small kingdoms were being overrun, if you like, and amalgamated into bigger kingdoms. So this was a very dynamic period. This, this, these are all the kingdoms, but if we simplify it a little bit to the ones that are of very great importance, because this is the area where Lord Buddha was teaching, yeah, then the things that is very important for us as what was happening in the areas where the Lord Buddha was teaching. We all know that Lord Buddha was born in the Sakyan clan. That's here. It was a, you know, a small republic actually. Although they always talk about King Sudodana like this. It's very, very misleading. He was Raja at Sudodana. All the three nobles in the republics were known as Rajas. Yeah. They were, Raja really means rather than king. Later it comes to mean king. But at that time, it really means leader. So the leaders of the clan were all called Raja. And Sudodana was a Raja, right? So it's anachronistic to think that he was the king uh, in the way that it's portrayed, you know, in basically all the uh, documentaries, all the cartoons and every kind of information that you get from the later period, but it's anachronistic actually. It wasn't the case. The Sakyans was really a small republic and Sudodana would have been one of the leading members of that republic and his son, uh, Siddhartha, uh, would have been one of the leading members uh, of the Republic also, right? But Kosala had become a kingdom, right? It had a, 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 a real king, King Pasenadi. Uh, he's known not only from Buddhist scriptures, he's known from the Jaina scriptures. He's also mentioned in the Brahminical scriptures. He's very surely uh, a historical person. And Pasenadi had managed to unify that area and, the, and he, he had created a monarchy and it was very strong and powerful political force in ancient India. And during Lord Buddha's time, the Sakyans had already become, probably by the time Lord Buddha had gone forth, they were already a suzerainty underneath Kosala that means they owed allegiance to Kosala. Kosala was really the were really the people who were in charge. And later the Sarkins were basically destroyed because they deceived a later king. They deceived the king and the king was not at all pleased by being deceived. 
and he would wage war on the Sakians, and only one family, Manama's family, uh, escaped. Probably the others were not entirely wiped out. They were probably just uh, integrated into the Kosalan kingdom and lost their separate identity. Uh, Manama's family uh, possibly survived, and nowadays you get in Nepal you'll get uh, people who claim descent from Manama's uh, family, and they still claim that they're Sakian and part of Lord Buddha's family come down two and a half thousand years. But basically, you see, that area was included into Kosala and also Kasi, which had been a major centre, this is where Benares is, Benares is around here on the Ganges and was a major city, probably one of the most established cities uh, in India, probably going back to maybe the 9th century, 8th century BCE. And that had been a separate state, but Kosala had overrun Kasi in a war, in a war as well, and had included into Kosala. So this is sometimes called Kasi and sometimes called Southern Kosala in the scriptures. A similar sort of thing had happened with Magadha, and Magadha had also uh, become very strong. It had already overrun the anger people and included the anger, and later it, over, it overrun the Lichavis as well, who were one of the major peoples who feature in the Lord Buddha's uh, teachings. That's where Vaisali is. So Vaisali is a very important centre in the scriptures. So you had these two great kingdoms like this, Kosala and Magadha, which had become uh, very powerful and they were centralised states ruling a larger and larger area. And the tribal confederacies were being gradually assimilated. This, all these political changes were taking place during Lord Buddha's time. Socially, things were developing at a high rate because of the discovery of iron or the, you know, the implementation of iron and being able to uh, clear the jungles and so on. And politically, it was uh, changing very quickly as well. Now then, I want to say something about the religious background as well. The Vedic literature is a bit complicated, but I'll just uh, give you like an outline of it. Uh, it, do it doesn't matter too much, you don't have to know all this, but it, it, but it has some bearing on it, because in the Tripitaka we also find uh, references to texts that are now contained in the Vedic literature, you see. So it's of some interest um, what the religious background uh, was in India at the time. The, Brahmin, the Brahmins had basically a different type of religion altogether to the Samanas. There's a big distinction between the Brahmanas and the Samanas. We'll come on to it in a minute, okay. But these were the two main religious groups in the uh, in ancient India at the time of Lord Buddha. Now this is concerning the Brahmana's religion. The Brahmana's religion was basically, they have, there's no temples for instance in the Brahmana's religion. They would have temporary shrines that they would set up. It was a home-based and sacrificial uh, religion. You know, for all pastoral peoples, even to this day, if you look at the way that they live, still we have pastoral peoples in, in, in Africa and so on and so forth. It's basically a sacrificial religion that they have, and the Brahmanas were no different. So a lot of the uh, Brahminical scriptures were concerned with the sacrifices and how they were carried out what we now collect as the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda and the Yajur Veda, which were the three main Vedas, Veda really means knowledge, 
Uh, what is the knowledge of? Is the knowledge of the gods. Yeah. It was important to have knowledge of the gods and by the correct implementation of the sacrifice you could control the gods. Yeah. If you do the sacrifice correctly, the gods must rain down on you, bring the rain down on you. Yeah. If you do the sacrifices correctly, uh, then the gods must bring success to your community. Yeah. Now, these uh, texts that are now collected in the Rig Veda, Samaveda, Yajurveda, they were originally brought down in families and um, uh, eventually they were collected uh, and now they come down to us in these Vedas. Uh, one interesting thing, just as an as aside, uh, just for your interest, these texts were passed down for like two and a half thousand, three thousand years orally. And the way they did it is in actual fact very interesting also for us now. They encrypted the Vedas. They had a way of encrypting the text. They had 16 different ways of reciting them. Not all of which make sense. It's not just simply, you know, like the way you would read a book. What they would do is recite eight syllables forward and then two syllables back and then eight syllables forward and two syllables back eight syllables forward two syllables back by rote they've learned it by rote I've, I've seen this being done by the way in India to this day they do this and when you decrypt them you can reassemble the text and when you do that very surprisingly you'll find that they all decrypt to the same text. They've been so well preserved, really an incredible feat of memory carried out over thousands of years to remember these texts uh, in this way. And just done by sheer mental power, it's really a fantastic thing. It's an aside, but the Buddhists did something quite similar uh, also, because the Buddhists also passed down their text orally for a long time as well and this was because people in those days had enormous memory capacity could remember uh, these texts if you know how enormous the uh, Buddhist scriptures are it, they never even been printed out they're abbreviated and printed out when, when we have like the tree pitaka printed there it's a, it's a massive abbreviation it's like a Reader's Digest version of what the texts actually are. Um, if, you was to print, if you were to print out uh, Paktana, which is just one book of the Abhidhamma, it would probably take up, you know, I don't know, maybe 30,000 pages or something like that. It's an enormous text. Anyway, uh, to get back to the uh, Vedic literature, these contain the sacrificial verses. That's, that's called the Samhita. Okay. The Brahmanas explain in detail, they're like a commentary, explaining in detail how the sacrifice is to be uh, performed. And they're very important because you perform the sacrifice right, wrong, you say the verse is wrong, you don't get the result. Okay. It has to be exactly right for the result to happen. Uh, so this was very important to them. Now the Aranyakas, uh, were, the Aranya means a forest, were when the Brahmins went to the forest and they started to reflect on the meaning, if you like, the spiritual meaning, the deep meaning of the sacrificial religion. It was an important development and out of that you started getting the Upanishads which were uh, formed the basis uh, for uh, parts of the Vedanta teaching now and two of those, the two very early, the earliest is probably the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad and the other one is the Chandogya Upanishad and these are very important they're the reflections that the Brahmins made on these sacrificial teachings trying to find out the deep spiritual meaning rather than the kind of physical meaning of the text, trying to synthesize uh, the teachings. 
So that was also, you see, a big change that was going on. Uh, they had started to think deeply about the religious teachings uh, that would be come down to them through the centuries, you know. The Vedas probably start about 2000 BC, but they were just being passed down as ways to uh, perform the sacrifice. And just before Lord Buddha's time, a, hundred, a century, two centuries also, before Lord Buddha's time, they had started going into the forest, meditating on them, and trying to reflect on the deep and inner meaning of this sacrificial religion. Right, now at the time of Lord Buddha, the two main groups, which are always m mentioned together, and uh, Samana Brahmana in, in the text, uh, were the Brahmanas and the Samanas. And this is quite interesting, really, because the Brahmanas have come down through the Aryan civilization. Yeah, this was this pastoral, sacrificial uh, civilization that had invaded and overthrown the Indus Valley. It, it is probably the case that the in Indus Valley civilization gave rise to the Samana cultures. The earliest one of those is probably that we uh, have any kind of real records of are the Jainas. The Jainas precede the Buddhists. And actually, in fact, they're quite similar in many ways. There are distinctions, uh, but in many ways, uh, they're quite similar uh, to the Buddhists and very distinct in many ways from the Brahmanas. This was an ascetic uh, teaching and there was the Jainas, the, the Buddhists, the Arjivakas, the Arjivakas who nobody kind of knows much about these days, never heard of them, they are mentioned in the Tripitaka, they actually outlasted the uh, Buddhists in India and there's records of the Arjivakas coming down all the way to about the 15th century where the Buddhists had already lost their hold in India by probably the 13th century. The Arjivakas went on longer and the Arjivakas uh, were a, a very important group, a very ascetic group. Uh, some of the earliest cave temples or cave maybe you can say cave monasteries in a way uh, which were which are in Baraba those were actually built for the Arjivakas uh, only later they were inhabited by uh, Buddhists uh, but these groups were also very uh, important uh, culture uh, but a distinct culture these were not sacrificial religions at all it was an ascetic and meditative uh, culture that had come down and the Buddhist teachings are positioned within that culture, the Samana culture and when you get the discussions in the Tripitaka sometimes the Buddha is discussing with the Brahmanas and he's trying to show them how to interpret the earlier teachings that had come to them the earlier Brahmana teachings in a ethical way if you like. There were teachings about Brahma for instance that came down and then the Lord Buddha said what was the real teaching about Brahma you know and it's from that that we get the Brahma Viharas, the gods, the real gods are not these wicked gods that uh, kind of smash cities. Uh, the, the gods that you find in the um, in, in the Vedas and in the early teaching and also sometimes now also you know are very vengeful they're tribal gods they hate their enemies yeah? they're jealous gods you look at the Christian gods you look at the Islamic gods you look also at the Hindu gods and the, the Brahm, Brahminical gods the, um, but you look at these you know some of them are you know, they're really quite uh, terrible, you know. They're, they're out for blood, they're out for revenge, and, you know, they only protect their own people, they hate other people like that. Now, when you come to the Buddhist teaching, uh, he showed what real gods are like. And when you get the descriptions of the heavens in the uh, Buddhist teachings, and how you get to those heavens, 
it's really all through what we would, everybody could recognize as good deeds, the heavens are beautiful heavens, the descriptions of the heavens in the Buddhist teachings are really, the heavens are really uh, wonderful places to be. And they're much more refined as well. If, if you look at um, the, the teachings in Islam or the teachings in the Abra Abrahamic religions, it only goes up to a certain level in the Buddhist scheme of things, you know, within the sense spheres, within, you know, it's actually a low level comparatively, you know, it's more refined than the, um, uh, the human levels, but it's not at, uh, at a very high level, you know, beyond that you get the Brahma levels, beyond that you get the Arupa levels, yeah. these are extremely refined uh, states of mind that you're talking about. Uh, in that place. It's not sensual pleasures and everybody indulging and getting their reward for, you know, uh, for calling on the name of whoever they've been calling on. One thing that is important is um, you'll, you'll often hear that uh, the Buddha was a good Brahmin, you know, he carried out all the Brahminical rites and his father was a good Brahmin and everything like this. In actual fact, it's completely false. The people who were strong in these areas at the time of Lord Buddha were not the Brahmins. The Brahmins were present, but they were not the strong force. The strong force was actually the Samanas. And the Samanas were strong force all the way down for hundreds of years. It's not until about the turn of the common era, about four or five centuries after Lord Buddha, that you first get the Brahmins ascend into power. Before that, the people who were very strong were the Samana groups. And the people who were supporting not only Lord Buddha, but also Mahavira, the Jainas, supporting the Arji, because uh, were the, you know, the kings at that time, they supported the Samana sects. And that's where their allegiance lay. During the development of the Mauryan Empire, which eventually spread out over a huge area I showed you earlier, uh, where Ashoka's air, uh, empire was, they were also, you see, supporting. They supported the Brahmanas, but their main allegiance was to the Samana sects, yeah, of which Lord Buddha's uh, teaching was one of the main uh, sects. So it's very important, you see. The Buddhists and other Samana sects were extremely successful. They had the ear of the kings on the one hand and the nobles on the other hand. And they had the, uh, also the ear, if you like, of the merchant class. Whereas the Brahmanas didn't really have either at that time. The Brahmanas eventually became very powerful and managed to kind of get their way into court and became a very uh, powerful force, but much later than Lord Buddha's time. That time, the people who were strong were the Samanas. The Brahmanas had uh, this kind of idea about the, the, this class society, and they were worshippers of Brahma, and they basically uh, they had this idea that the Brahmanas, they themselves, had come from the head of Brahma. Uh, the Katyas, that's the noble, nobles, came from the body. You know, the body is the strong uh, kind of area in, in the body. So the nobles had come from the body. The Vesas had come from the legs. That's with merchants, you know. They had come from the legs. And the Suttas, they're within the class system, but you couldn't teach, for instance, the Vedas to Suddhas. You can't teach the religious teachings. The Suddhas were not allowed to know, them, to know those teachings at all. They're too low in the scale, to this day, to know those teachings, those, the Vedic teachings, you know. But this is how the Brahmanas uh, pictured the world. The Samanas didn't picture it that way at all. Uh, for one thing, they didn't have Brahma as being like the kind of uh, the, the gods are only of certain 
significance, not, not central significance, only of a certain significance in the Samana religions. Now then, all of this I think is quite important to understand the background to the teaching. Why? When we read the scriptures, you'll find the whole world is populated with this. Yeah. The geography is very important, where the Lord Buddha is going, the cities that he's teaching in, the kings that he's talking to, what the position of the kings was, yeah. the merchants who built the monasteries. All of this is central to the picture of the thing and they don't just you know it, it isn't just appeared out of nowhere yeah there's a background to how this had all developed uh, so it's very important the social groups that existed at Lord Buddha's time like the Brahmanas, the Samanas, the Vesas and so on this is also also, also very important uh, to understand to get a proper picture of what was happening at the time to understand also that the society was changing at a very rapid pace. Uh, this also has a very great significance because the Lord Buddha, if you uh, think about it, one of the most significant teachings that he was giving was about impermanence and what you can see all around you at that time is you know, enormous impermanence on all sorts of scale. Uh, you know, on the social scale, the political scale, religious uh, teachings were changing and everything like this. And Lord Buddha comes, comes up with a teaching about impermanence. It really makes sense to a people who are living in the midst of, you know, what was not any longer a stable society. Previously, it would be, you know, society was taking very long periods to develop slowly, yeah, and suddenly you've got into the superhighway, really, and things are changing very fast, and then Lord Buddha is teaching about impermanence, it really makes sense to the people that he's talking to, because they can see it all around them, you see. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, Lord Buddha's teaching was so important. The Lord Buddha also, if you remember, taught about the universal monarch. This is also a new teaching about the universal monarch. That's the monarch who manages to unify all the diverse states and all the diverse republics into one. Who became the universal monarch? Who fulfilled that eventually was Ashoka, isn't it? He managed to unify the whole of India, which is basically the known world, if you like, right? And the Lord Buddha had talked about the universal monarch and what the universal monarch should be like. Yeah? Not just powerful, not just all powerful, and kind of crushing his, en his, crushing his en enemies as a kind of um, human reflection of what the gods were, were doing. Yeah. That's in fact how Ashoka started out. But when he learned Buddhism, he learned what a true universal monarch should be. Yeah. Which is one who, li one who uh, lives by and rules by Dhamma. Yeah, the Dhamma Vijaya. Yeah. He gave up conquest by arms and he started the conquest by Dhamma, by teaching people how to live properly. And if you teach people how to live properly, then you know they will uh, swear allegiance to you. Now it's true today, right? If, if your leaders were not corrupt, yeah, if they were not corrupt, if one person stood forward and was truly ethical and was not taking bribes and all the rest of it, right? If one person did that, everybody would follow him, wouldn't they? Yeah? Everybody is fed up with corruption, isn't it? Not just in Malaysia, not just, but it's everywhere, you know? It's also true even in, uh, in the West as well. It's a different sort of corruption in the West, you know? But the corporations buy 
the, you know, the U.S. president is corrupt, you know. But if, if one person was, who was really powerful learned the Dhamma and was actually a Dhammic teacher, you would all follow him, wouldn't you? Yeah? You, you would accept the Dhamma Vijaya, whereas you won't accept the kind of, you know, the, all this corruption and everything. Nobody wants that, you see. So, you, you can see it's actually a powerful teaching that people will accept and everything. And it's through that powerful teaching and understanding that teaching that Ashoka managed to spread that empire, you know, from Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, what's now India, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, and out from there also into, you know, Burma, Suwanabhumi, into uh, Thailand, down into Sri Lanka, and out into Central Asia, and so on and so forth. They also sent missions over to uh, Alexandria as well. So another important thing you see, the Buddha was giving teachings that made sense to the people that he was giving teachings to and that they could implement and that people would follow and recognize as being uh, relevant to their lives. Whereas the Brahminical teachings, yeah, they were not relevant anymore. That was a teaching for a pastoral, sacrificial religion was relevant for that society at that time. It has its own relevance at that time, given their world concepts. Yeah? But at the time of Lord Buddha and so on, through the centuries, it no longer makes sense. And it wasn't until the uh, Brahmins completely remade their religion. Right? By accepting all the Shramana teachings into the Brahminical teachings, and that marriage of the Brahmana culture and the Shramana culture is that marriage that we now call Hinduism. Yeah. Hinduism does not go back to uh, Lord Buddha's time or to the early Brahminical time at all. Right? It actually arises about the 5th century AD, 5th century of the Common Era. It's that late when they finally accepted the Shramana teachings into the uh, thing. Now, another influence uh, that I, I mentioned, which is also very important, okay, the, uh, the societies uh, that Lord Buddha was born into was a tribal type society where the free men, if you like, the nobles, all had an egalitarian say. They all had a say in the way that the uh, society was being run on a kind of equal basis. They were not being run by monarchs, okay? They were free nobles, right? When the Lord Buddha formed the Sangha, very, very specifically, he did not make a Sangha Raja or a monarchical system. He made a Republican system. Actually, it's a low level, what we would say now, a face-to-face -face democracy is how the Sangha is organized. All the monks have an equal voice. We recognize that elders are there, just like they recognize in the tribal societies. Elders are very important. Why? They have, they have much more experience. And experience is extremely important. Even new monks, when they start, uh, you know, they don't know what they're doing very much. No, it's true, you know, because they don't have the experience. And, it's a, it, you know, we have an extremely complex uh, judicial system in, uh, in Buddhism. And another in, important point uh, I can make about this is, you know, the, the Vinaya is actually a judicial system, yeah? it's a juridical system that goes back two and a half thousand years and is still in force today. Yeah? It's the only system that goes back so far and is still in force today. And it, it, we still live by the Vinaya rules and by the way that was taught. And it's a parallel juridical system. 
that's still going on two and a half thousand years without change. We don't change the vineyard. The vineyard, as it was taught in Lord Buddha's time, or probably slightly after that time, there's probably some additions in the early years, but from from very early period it was settled and it comes down to us now. Another very important thing you see, the Lord Buddha set up a judicial system that lasted two and a half thousand years and is still in force today. It's quite an amazing achievement if you think about it. Right? And that's the system that the Sangha lives by. And that system is a is a face to face to face democracy. Yeah. You know, if, if you understand the kind of areas he was teaching, the kind of uh, you know the geography and everything like this, the kind of environment that he was in, social environment, religious environment, and so on and so forth like that, then the whole teaching comes to life because the little Buddha was not teaching in a vacuum. Now, when the teachings are given, when you give it in a vacuum, it's like eternal truths. But when the Lord Buddha was teaching, he was teaching actually against the background. And if you understand that background, you understand how the teachings arise as they arise in specific circumstances, you know. But at the heart of them, they have a universal truth. And that's the important thing, you know. Eventually, the Lord Buddha's teachings, given in real society, with real people, when, when he's teaching to people, it's so uh, amazing. You know, different people come to him from lower sections of society, middle sections of society, higher sections of society, kings, uh, courtesans, all different people come to him and he has teachings for everybody. If you read the scriptures, it's really amazing when you see this. It's really inspiring, you know, uh, to see how he's able to meet everybody. The Brahmins come to him and he's able to teach the Brahmins in a way they can understand. The Samanas come to him, he's able to teach the Samanas in the way they can understand. Kings and queens come to him and he can speak to them on their level. Beggars come to him and he can speak to them as well, you know. But you've got to know the society to know who he's teaching to. You see.